Now xenophobic is to chase foreign nations away forever. So that was temporary? No, it wasn't temporary. There was just a, a fight. This week, we're in Rafilwe Township, east of Pretoria, to get a better understanding of why xenophobic attacks are on the rise in the country. We decided to take a look at what happened here in February to get a clearer picture of the issues in general. As you'll soon see, the complexity of what is going on in our townships needs urgent attention if the cycle of violence is to be stopped. This is Checkpoint, and I'm in Kepile Mabuse. years, locals and foreigners lived peacefully here in Rafilwe. Why then did violence erupt in February? Well, residents went on the rampage overnight as several shops were looted. This morning, police firing tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse the crowd. They've escorted several foreign nationals out of the area. Which... Violence erupted earlier over the death of a 10-year-old boy last week. The child was allegedly beaten by a Pakistani shop owner for stealing sweets. The script is almost always the same. Allegations of a murder or an assault surface and foreign nationals are accused of the crime. We are sick and tired about this Pakistan because right now we've lost one of our community members. So in fact there is no help, they didn't pay tax, so they must go out. So you want them, all of them to leave? All of them, all of them. No mercy for them. No compromise. <laughs> Rumours, anger and violence quickly spread as communities run amok. Earlier today, uh, the police were seen escorting uh, the Pakistani shop owners out of the township uh, as of course they were being threatened by residents who were angry over the death of uh, this 10-year-old uh, boy. This time it was Refilwe in February. The relatively quiet township east of Pretoria grabbed national headlines when foreigners were violently kicked out. One of them was accused of murder. The death he was blamed for was confirmed by the police. The 10-year-old boy was assaulted last week by a foreigner shop owner where he was stolen uh, some sweets. The boy uh, died at the hospital at the latter stage. And as, according to that, all the violence started here in the field way. When the dust had settled, Checkpoint went back to investigate why this seemingly mellow community resorted to such extreme violence. The first thing we learned was that the story of the 10-year-old boy killed by a Pakistani for stealing sweets was fabricated. In normal circumstances, a case is, uh, must be opened. And uh, we never received such a case. Despite confirming the death in February, police now say the incident never happened. Instead, the real story they tell us is that this man, 41-year-old John Dao, was allegedly beaten on the head by an Ethiopian shopkeeper a full four weeks before the community's reaction. Two other foreign nationals were arrested for shooting at residents amidst the chaos. We tracked John Dao's family and found his old and frail parents living in shocking poverty. They told us that the residents' anger was not sparked by their son's death, but by the amount of compensation the alleged attacker was offering to pay. Dawa's father tells us it was members of the local ANC who demanded more money from the alleged attacker and who started the looting. This was confirmed by the ANC ward councillor. Uh, 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 we were communicating very nicely with that, that guy. So now the problem started when he say he don't have money and he can only help with uh, something like 3,000. Uh, some angry people, they started uh, breaking the shop to say, no, these people, they're going to kill our kids here. We don't want them anymore, you see. Were they upset about the amount of money yes. that the foreign national? Yes. 
how do you feel as a leader within the ANC that majority of the people who were arrested for looting and stealing and for public violence are ANC members? Yeah, I was very much disappointed. But what I know is that uh, some of them were not looting. Party followers came out in their numbers to support the more than 30 people arrested for possession of stolen goods and public violence. And this woman, who identified herself to us as a member of the ANC, admitted that she too was among the looters. <laughs> She says the police also took part in the theft. The police have denied this allegation. She also blames local business people for using community members to frustrate their foreign competitors. While Checkpoint was at court, behind the scenes something peculiar was unfolding. The foreigners who had been kicked out of Refilwe a week previously were helping to bail out their alleged attackers. They too had a chief negotiator, Ethiopian national David Angebo. Uh, it is pain but we can't do anything because it's passed already. We need to be together with these people, with a community. And we stay for long here, we stay like a family. And I feel it never happened any wrong thing. We are helping a community, community they help us. That's what I know. Are you going back to the community to sell? Yes. Yeah. After, this, after they release these co uh, people who they arrested, we'll go and we'll talk to them, to the community. The ANC is a very wealthy party. I mean, why do you have to get money from foreign nationals? <laughs> yeah, it's very big also. You're watching Checkpoint and I'm in Gepile Mabuse. As we continue our story, we find a link between politics, money and violence. An unexpected connection between foreign nationals and the local ANC is at the heart of it. While attending the court case of those arrested for looting and public violence in Rafilwe in February, Checkpoint was told by community members that shops belonging to foreign nationals who support the ward councillor with money and goods were not attacked. I'm using the milky, mahawi, chews. We interviewed desperate foreign shopkeepers like Somali national Mohammed Pasuri Arda, who was totally cleaned out. Because it was for fridge for the cold ring and the milky, and the two deep freezer who was here. One it was big one from here to there, it was slight free, also it's gone. Other one also it was here. Also, I'm using the ice pop, all that thing is, is, is gone. Look at also here, it was electricity here. The box, box himself is gone, including all the wires, even the lights, everything was it's gone. When we arrived at Angebo's shop, it was clear that his was left untouched. He's the ringleader Checkpoint met at court who helped bail out the alleged looters. There are some in the community who believe that your shop was not badly looted because you have a good relationship with the councillor here, with the ANC councillor here. Is that true? Nah, it is not like that. Many of community members, I have a good relationship. It's not only councillor. He confirms that he gives goods and money to the councillor and to those who produce letters bearing the councillor's signature. Also, councillor, he said, if there is no uh, my signature, don't give anything. Shockingly, Machila doesn't deny asking foreign shop owners for goods and money. But he stresses that it is not for his personal needs, but for the needs of the ANC. He denies exploiting their vulnerability and says he's never offered them protection in return. If we need bread 
for our canvassers, we will ask bread for our canvassers. If they don't want, we won't force them. But the ANC is a very wealthy party. I mean, why do you have to get money from foreign nationals? <laughs> yeah, it's very big also. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a government uh, uh, organization. So obviously, if they come to refill to my ward and give us 2,000 rand for the campaigns, and it, it, will, it won't be enough. Checkpoint came to Rafilwe in search of answers. But what is clear is that the issues here and possibly elsewhere in the country are layered and complex. The councillor himself appears unsure about what xenophobia actually is. It was totally not xenophobic. That, that's why you see these people are now back uh, again, opening their, their shops. Why do you say it was not xenophobic? No, xenophobic is to chase foreign nations away forever, you see, yes. So that was temporary? No, it wasn't temporary. There was just a, a fight. The absence of serious consequences for xenophobic acts has created an atmosphere of impunity in communities. Increasingly, when police arrive at these scenes, they escort foreign nationals as quickly as possible, leaving their shops at the mercy of the locals, like what happened here in Everton. So my Pakistan have a problem. No resolution about it. Come on, come on. Even if we have a first resolution, yes. In Dubai, we can feel like we are very concerned. Ena ne batu ba habori na batu trunku. Lebo na ba bo. Lebo na ba bo. Ena ne batu ba beri kisana lera na kamku. Pusuri says stock worth eighty thousand rand disappeared within minutes. He borrowed money from a fellow Somali national and is back in Rafilwe trading. Ah, business is very quiet, very quiet, very very quiet. Why do you say that? Why do you think that's the case? Uh, I don't know really, but. Some people, they say, still people have st stock in the sh houses, but we don't know. But the business is quiet, just we're going to see end of the month if it's changed. Foreign shopkeepers are rarely permanently kicked out of their trading areas. That's because when they are gone, locals suffer as well. In the weeks following their exodus in Refilwe, prices for bread, eggs and basic foodstuff shot up by more than 100%. A study by Wits University titled Somali Nomics has revealed that contrary to popular perceptions, Somali traders are not wealthy business people. They jointly invest in shops by sharing transport, sourcing special offers at wholesalers and negotiating discounts. Trade practices that are not impossible for South Africans to implement. The study concludes that Somali businesses have opened up new job opportunities by providing income to landlords and cheaper prices to the poor. In Rafilwe, some local business people admit that although they despise the competition, they are learning a thing or two from the way foreigners do business in the townships. Mm. Today, calm has returned to Rafilwe, but John Dower's family is still distraught. They have since discovered that negligence at Mamelodi Hospital, where Dao was admitted, may be to blame for his death. His father tells us he was prematurely discharged and that his condition worsened while at home. By the time he was readmitted, it was too late. The cause of death was also erroneously recorded as natural. The family have now opened an inquest with the police and a post-mortem has revealed that he died from complications of his head injury. The family want justice but cannot afford a lawyer. That the community seems to care little about mobilizing around. Welcome back to Checkpoint. I'm in Gebile Mabuse. Last week, we received a call from somebody we had interviewed during our probe into Joseph Matunjwa and the Labour Union, Amku. He called to alert us that his house had been burned. We went back to the Platinum Belt to find out what had happened.
Three weeks ago, Checkpoint was at a rally in Rustenburg, where miners who wanted to go back to work gathered to hear traditional leaders address them about the ongoing strike in the platinum industry. <laughs> AMCO supporters disrupted the meeting, and some of those in attendance were left angry and frightened. The people left for their lives. What I can assure you is that these people are arrogant, lethal, they can kill you. I was at one stage when I raised my opinion against the strike. They chased me up to my house. They threatened to kill me. It's two of us. There's another guy who's the owner of the house. He left the residence for his life. The other guy who is in hiding with Matale is NUM member Romeo Mihwe, who also wants to go back to work. At the time, we filmed him going with Matale to the Pokeng police station to get a protection order against an AMCO member who Romeo said was harassing him. Um, yeah, we are here at the police station to, to give the police, pol, uh, the police to, to get the police to accompany us to look at village where we're going to serve one of uh, AMCO organizers with a protection order as they've been threatening us with our lives and my, uh, my family. Checkpoint followed Romeo to deliver the protection order to the AMCO member whose identity we are not revealing. In the end, Checkpoint did not broadcast Romeo's story due to time constraints. But we went to investigate when he called early in the morning last week to say his house had been burned. By the time we arrived at Romeo's house, the police had sealed off the area and were conducting forensic investigations into the possibility of an arson attack. The police confirmed that these attacks are part of an ongoing pattern of frightening violence against those who want to go back to work. This is not just a singular incident that has occurred in the area. There is many other uh, of the almost a similar nature or a similar kind that we are following. Those who are on strike uh, wants to take the law and undermine the rule of law by then intimidating, uh, attacking, uh, banning properties of those who are going to work. Romeo says that this is the third time he has been attacked. Uh, on the 25th of January, I was attacked at work while we were busy doing uh, the register of the people who, are, who want to go to work. On the 8th of March, I was attacked while I was, doing, I was having a meeting with the people who want to return to work. Yesterday, my house was burned because yesterday uh, we, we, we were having a rally at Impala for the people who want to return to work. Since the Marigana massacre and the death of 44 people on the platinum industry in 2012, a private investigator in the area says 41 more people have died. We invited AMCO to the MCCF, which is the Mine Crime Combating Forum, where AMCO is the only missing union. And that very forum is a forum that deals with matters of security and peace within the platinum belt. And they've never responded to that call at any given time. And we have, on numerous occasions, requested that AMCO and AMCO president uh, Mr. Matunjwa should be heard condemning issues of violence and crimes. Despite repeated attempts to get a response from AMCO, Checkpoint's queries were not answered. Romeo and his family are in hiding and were not here when the attack took place. No one was injured, but the constant fear and the strain are taking a terrible toll on him and his family. My wife, because she was afraid, then she did get miscarriage because she was afraid of it. This woman who lives nearby says she was woken in the middle of the night by sounds. She spoke to us on condition that we conceal her identity. <laughs> Romeo remains unbowed in opposing the strike. They say what goes around comes around. If the wheels will turn, even though they turn slowly. My revenge, it will be the law. I'm not a person who is so violent. I'm not that kind of a person. But mine, it will be the law. That is my revenge. 
In this new feature, we go global to see what South African stories are making headlines beyond our country's borders. There's absolutely no question that the world is gripped by the Oscar Pistorius trial. But another story that has grabbed the world's attention is President Jacob Zuma's multi-million rand Nganda upgrade. Our contributors have more. I am John Bailey in Beijing, China. Opulence on a grand scale, wrote the Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post, while the headline in the Japanese Times said, Licensed Loot, taking its cue from South Africa's Mail and Guardian. Most papers here that covered the story refer to the scathing media reaction in South Africa and elsewhere. Referring to Jacob Zuma as a tainted leader who is running for office again, the Japanese Times said the ANC is trying to divert attention from its president by saying all those involved in maladministration must be brought to book. Describing South Africa's justice system, the Times said the country's laws are vague about the consequences of the head of state breaking the ethics code. The encounter story has sent two conflicting messages. The performance of public protector Tuli Madoncella has provided a powerful rebuttal to the view espoused by Harvard's Professor Alan Dershowitz that South Africa is a failed nation. But it hasn't been enough to reassure his Harvard colleague Robert Rotberg, who wrote in the Wall Street Journal of 19 March that, quote, South Africa suffers from shockingly underwhelming leadership, worsening governance, rampant official corruption, corrosive levels of crime, weak educational attainments, and a deadening loss of hope among young and old. South Africa, wrote Rotberg, has lost its moral authority. With or without Nkandla, these are challenging times in this market for brand South Africa. This is John Battersby in London. If the trial of Oscar Pistorius has put South Africa's judiciary on trial, then the Nkanda report by public protector Tuli Madonsela has put the country's democratic constitution on trial. As the Nkanda report joined the Pistorius trial as major trenders on social media in South Africa, internationally the Pistorius trial trended higher on Facebook and Twitter, but the interest waxed and waned according to daily developments in the courtroom. The Public Protector's report on Nkandla and her criticism of the President was well covered in the mainstream British media this week in a way that will strengthen perceptions that the democratic processes in the country are working despite the major economic and political challenges South Africa is facing. The Financial Times focused on the ruling ANC's defence of President Zuma while the BBC focused on the decision by the Democratic Alliance to lay criminal charges against the President and call for his impeachment. I'm Tumalem Mkhlaudi from South Africa. Now looking at the reaction across Africa, it really depends on the region uh, you focus on. Uh, online there have been calls from East Africa for President Jacob Zuma to repay what has been termed unethical upgrades to the Nkandla homestead. Now, if you look at West Africa, uh, Nigeria, it's been very interesting because they have gone so far as to term the upgrade as unlawful. Please stay in touch with us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and email. Thanks for watching Checkpoint. I'm in Gibile Mabuse.